welcome friends to a presentation and lunch party for our new online exhibition, Queer Spirit Podcast. I'm Mark Bowman, Executive Director of the LGBTQ Religious Archives Network, the host of tonight's program. LGBTQ Ren is a unique venture dedicated to preserving the history of LGBTQ religious movements around the world. LGBTQ Ren is a digital enterprise. We are not a physical repository that stores papers. We advise and support leaders and groups in their efforts to preserve their records in appropriate archives. Furthermore, we collect and provide a treasure of historical information on our website about LGBTQ persons and groups from a wide array of religious expressions around the world. And finally, we encourage research and scholarship in queer religious history. Tonight, we are previewing a new addition to the LGBTQ REN website. Queer Spirit was a radio show turned podcast that first aired in 2019. Queer Spirit was a series of interviews with queer spiritual leaders in Maine that explored queer life and the power of the sacred. When the podcast series concluded in 2022, and the producers realized that the community radio station that aired them would not preserve the recordings, they approached me to ask if LGBTQ Ren could help. Realizing that these interviews were a valuable part of queer religious history, I agreed that LGBTQ Ren would provide a home for the recordings on our website. A small grant from the Haney Layton Fund covered technical design and a stipend for an intern to curate this exhibit. Tonight, you will get to hear curator Chris Stinson converse with Queer Spirit producers Marvin Ellison and Tamara McGovern Torres about what inspired them to undertake these wide ranging interviews and what they learned on this journey. Chris will also take you on a virtual tour of the new Queer Spirit podcast exhibit. Christopher Stinson, PhD, is a historian of religion in America and is pursuing an MDiv at Princeton Theological Seminary. His scholarship has examined such themes as religion, empire, sexuality, and stories, and he is currently completing a book on the history of archaeology and religion. He interned part-time this summer with LGBTQ RAN to design and create this exhibit. The Reverend Dr. Marvin Ellison is a retired professor at Bangor Theological Seminary, where he taught generations of clergy and chaplains and lectured widely on ethical re issues related to human sexuality, health care, and economic justice. He has published numerous essays on same-sex marriage, gender justice in Protestant Christianity, and changing patterns of family life. He is the author of multiple books, including Erotic Justice, A Liberating Ethic of Sexuality, Body, uh, and of Sexuality, Body and Soul, Rethinking Sexuality is Justice Love, and Sexuality in the Sacred, Sources for Theological Reflection. In 1994, Marvin founded the Religious Coalition Against Discrimination in Maine to support civil rights protections for LG LGBTQ persons, including the right to marry. Reverend Tamara Torres McGovern found her way to ministry following a path which included spiritual formation as a yoga instructor, holistic cook, folk musician, and massage therapist. While studying at Union Theological Seminary in New York, she spent time on the U.S.-Mexico border and designed a program called Voices from the Margins. Ordained at Judson Memorial Church in 2013, Tamara has served congregations and emergent spiritual communities in, Maine, in Connecticut, Maine, and Colorado. Alongside Marvin Ellison, she has volunteered as a community chaplain for Planned Parenthood in New England. Together, Tamara and Marvin developed and co-hosted the Queer Spirit radio series. And now I am pleased to welcome Chris Tamara and Marvin to begin this presentation. 
Thanks so much, Mark. That's wonderful. Welcome everyone who is with us live tonight and whoever is watching this recording down the road. Um, to get us going, I think it's really important in order to understand the spirit behind this show, and that is a pun that is intended. Um, it is necessary to understand where the show came from um, and the ways that it sought to provide a counter narrative to prevailing assumptions around spirituality and sexuality. So first up, I want to turn it over to Marvin to ask simply if you could give us a little bit about the background of this show, um, where and why did it begin? Oh, thanks so much, Chris. Well, maybe the place to start is, uh, truth be told, uh, religion is about many things. It's also clearly about desire. What kind of world do we most desire? And what kind of people do we yearn to be? Now, you know, some folks desire a world without LBGTQ folks, without queerness. And others would like a world without religion. But I think it's safe to say, if I could speak for a moment for Tamara, that she and I work with a very different set of assumptions. We understand uh, that spirituality and queerness uh, go hand in hand and are far more beautiful, far more powerful uh, when they are brought closely, intimately uh, uh, together. Our, our Queer Spirit podcast, this series of interviews with LBGTQ faith leaders and spiritual seekers shows that there's not a singular way, rather there are multiple good ways to be queer and religious, queer and spiritual. Tamara and I recorded these interviews during a three-year period from 2019 through 2012. And I'd like to joke that we uh, became syndicated uh, during those three, three years because we aired not on one community radio station, but two. Uh, radio stations in in Maine. Uh, so how did it start? Well, sometime back in 2018, I was approached by the Outcast Radio Collective, a, a group of artists and activists who were creating programs for queer radio. And they very kindly asked if I would do a single interview to talk about being queer and religious. Well, Tamara and I came back with a, a counter proposal. We offered to develop a whole series of interviews with queer folks in Maine, talking about their lives and talking about the power of the sacred. And so Queer Spirit uh, in Maine was born. And then over the course of those three years, we recorded about three dozen uh, conversations, 30 of which we're now sharing uh, as this online exhibit, thanks to LBGTQ Religious Archives Network. So many thanks go to you, Mark Bowman, and also many, many thanks to, to Chris Stinson, who's really been the driving force uh, behind this uh, putting this exhibit together. And uh, Mark had already mentioned, but I have to give a shout out to the Ellie Haney and Debbie Layton Fund that were so generous in giving us financial support. But also I want to do a shout out to our friends and colleagues at Outcast Radio um, for their encouragement for us to do the series and then to, to bring it to LBGTQ Religious Archives Network and, and go uh, even bigger. That's fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Marvin. Thanks, Tamara. It's been my pleasure working with you this summer. In my welcomes, I should have also welcomed the fact that we are blessed and honored to have a lot of the folks who made up the show itself with us tonight. 
Um, and it was wonderful to get to see your names down there. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, so love the background and we'll get to see a little bit more of that when we tour the exhibit itself. And you can dive into that if you visit the exhibit itself on your own time. Um, but I wonder Marvin and Tamara, if you could give us a taste of what these shows, what these episodes actually looked like and how they unfolded with the people that you interviewed. Uh, thanks, Chris. Well, here was something difficult. Um, Tamara and I wanted to share a, a few snippets, uh, sort of enticement uh, to those who are here this evening to little hear bits and pieces from the interviews. But then we actually had to think about uh, a, a few that we could offer tonight that would just represent some of the diversity of voices and experiences and perspectives. So, um, we, we want to share four of those snippets now. Um, maybe to begin, I should say that in each of the interviews, Tamara and I began by inviting our guest to talk about the spiritual tradition that had formed them, if they do have a, a tradition uh, from uh, as a uh, were growing up, but then to also uh, describe um, where they find themselves. Right. So I invite you now to listen to Christy Davis, who was raised in a Mormon family, and hear how she answers that question. I identify as an ex-Mormon first. Um, and I'd like to say also that I have a great deal of respect for members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and for their devotion to what they believe is, is true and right. And um, I mean no disrespect by anything I say today. Um, I consider myself an ex-Mormon. Uh, I left the church three years ago, but my spirituality is defined differently now than it was when I was in the church. When I was in the church, the definition of, or the 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 definition of being spiritual and righteous was your performances of you know how many prayers you said and how much you read the scriptures and how much service you did if you went to church every week, uh, if you fulfilled your assignments and uh, went to the temple, just a lot of performances. Uh, but now my spirituality is very much within myself and uh, coming from myself, kind of a fountain from within. So that's a little taste of uh, Christy Davis's interview, which is rich and complex and really speaks to um, some of the fault lines, I think, in in how we hold these dual identities of being people of faith or people of spirit and queer people, because so often we've been told that there's this, this uh, firewall between these identities. And so figuring out how do we, especially leaving traditions that haven't welcomed us, how do we have intact senses of a spiritual life? How do we hold ourselves together? Um, another question that we have asked, uh, I wanna turn to another voice. Um, which is the voice of Ophelia Hugh Kenny. Uh, she is the director of communications at Reconciling Ministries Network, which is an organization that is advancing LGBTQ justice and inclusion in the United Methodist Church. So you can imagine she has had her hands full in these last years. Um, she's also a worship coordinator at Hope Gateway in Portland, Maine, uh, and she is a writer uh, and writes about curating spiritual imagination and about the divine. And we asked Ophelia in our interview about her work, her vocation, her calling, her commitments. We want to make that broad because I think we all have different places that we live more fully into those, those places of calling in our life. Uh, we asked her how she is living out her queerness and her spirituality. And, and let's just listen to a snippet from Ophelia's interview. So my work, I think, brings me a lot of joy and I'm very grateful for it. I think that uh, my life has probably been preparing me for what I can do today. And at times in the past, I've felt like an imposter because um, in the world of doing ministry, um, 
it's anomalous, I guess, to be a person who lacks a Christian childhood or any formal theological training. And yet this is the world that I'm thrust into now. But I do think that what I've been preparing to do throughout my life is to serve as kind of like a faith translator. So as the child of immigrants, I grew up speaking a different language and a different culture altogether from what my parents had experienced and definitely what they expected. And being queer and having to seek out an understanding of God that differed from the kind of Christianity that I'd known before and that I was so suspicious of, those experiences, I think, prepared me to be um, kind of an interlocutor between groups of people who might otherwise miss out on each other or misunderstand each other. So the work that I do, if I were to sum it up in a nutshell, is that I enjoy translating the divine, um, experiences thereof, the presence of the divine, the divinity within other people. And I'm also passionate about holding the door open for other queer Christians who are coming into the fullness of who they are and trying to decide or learn through what that means for their faith journey. So, you know, I, I'm hoping that as folks are listening to this, maybe they hear some places where there's an echo of something that they have lived in their own spiritual journey, in their own journey of queerness and having a full life uh, in both their spirituality and in their uh, their sexuality and their gender identity. Um, so I hope that there's some of that resonance that you might catch in some of these stories, some places that you go, oh yes, I thought I was the only one. But then there are going to also be places that you hear a voice talking about things in a way that is really, um, uh, perhaps expands your understanding. And for me, one of those places was in the interview we did with Rabbi Rachel Isaacs. Um, so a question that we asked many of our participants had to do with the different generational perspectives that we bring to issues in the LGBTQ community. And so in this interview with Rabbi Rachel Isaacs, who is the spiritual leader of Beth Israel Congregation in Waterville, Maine, and also a faculty member at Colby College, where she holds the Dorothy Levine Alfond Chair in the Jewish Studies Department. Uh, and she also, um, in, in this interview, Rachel talks about the fact that she made history as the first openly lesbian rabbi admitted and ordained at Jewish Theological Seminary, which is the conservative movement's flagship institution. Um, and, and just one more thing before we get into Rabbi Rachel's interview, a, a fun little side, sack, uh, side fact is that Rabbi Isaacs was invited to offer the final Hanukkah benediction of the Obama administration in 2016. She, is, she has been named in magazines as one of 15 uh, Jewish leaders to look out for. She is a treasure uh, nationally, but especially a treasure in rural Maine, which is not necessarily where one would expect to find um, her teaching. And so we, we met with Rabbi Isaacs and we asked her uh, what she thought had been her generation's struggle with sexuality and spirituality. So let's listen to her response here. Our struggle and what we're dealing with now are more issues of gender identity and trans issues and non-binary issues as well. I think that is where we are, at where the cusp of that wave in the Jewish community. Um, I remember when I was at Wellesley, right, I mentioned that, that being gay wasn't a big deal in that Lilith interview because it was Wellesley, like a huge percentage of the students, it was a women's college, were bisexual, lesbian, or just in relationships with women. Um, but I remember hearing the, the sort of beginnings of students saying trans is the new gay, right? I remember that in the early 2000s, that being gay is no big deal. Like the real issue is, is trans folk. And that was true for Wellesley uh, right after I, I graduated and still to this day to a certain extent. And, and that's the issue that's coming up in conservative and orthodox circles right now, so much of Jewish law is based on the idea of a gender binary, right? Even though the Talmud said, actually, there are four genders, not two. So we have something that we can go back to in the tradition to provide more wisdom into answering these questions. But the rabbis are very interested in categorizing and putting people 
and things in boxes. That's how the halachic, the Jewish legal system works. Well, in a generation that really, it isn't just that they eschew labels, they think of them as a form of violence and oppression. How do you square that with, with Jewish tradition and Jewish law? Especially considering a lot of non-binary and trans folks say, we want to be in traditional communities. We don't want to be in, in liberal communities. And so how do you make a place? How do you make a language that's honest to the tradition, but also validates people's experience and, and the wisdom that they can bring to, to Jewish leadership? Listening to these, I'm, I'm remembering that um, having had the uh, delight of uh, doing these interviews one-on-one -on -one with Tamara and our guests, how much I yearned for the possibility that one day we could gather everyone together and just have unended amount of time and space just to be able to talk with each other and listen more deeply and uh, have a chance to interact. And uh, can you just imagine uh, the richness of that conversation? Well, one other question, among others, that we uh, typically pose to our guests, and remember, we did these interviews uh, at the height of the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic, and as our nation was reeling under the presidency of, of Donald Trump. So these were very challenging days, and it was no exaggeration to say uh, many days, most days, the world felt on fire. And, and acknowledging that, we would ask our guests, uh, tell us something uh, about what's troubling your spirits these days, as well as what is feeding your spirit. And here's a portion of how Thomas Brown the Episcopal Bishop of Maine, uh, an out gay man, um, how, uh, how he answered that question in part. A, a, a great source of feeling nourished. Um, when I first went to seminary in the fall of 1994, I had to sign a written covenant with my bishop, the Episcopal Bishop of Western Michigan. Uh, I went to seminary in Berkeley, California, and drove across the country on uh, leaving Kalamazoo on the 21st of August in my little Plymouth duster. Uh, and uh, the day before at church, uh, the bishop actually sat in the pew that morning, uh, but um, he handed me the signed covenant that I had made earlier in the week and then he had signed. And so he handed me this envelope and the covenant was that I would attend morning, I would, I would attend all chapel services at the seminary's chapel, or I would say morning prayer every day. Uh, and because I was 23 years old and obedient and eager, uh, even more eager than I am now, I did exactly as I said I would. And so a great source of nourishment for me ever since, and still is now in these days of pandemic tide, uh, continues to be the rich tradition of the daily office, of saying morning prayer, uh, and the sort of ancient form of a short uh, service of worship that is, um, for me, largely private, uh, and um, especially in these days of staying safe at home, I find morning prayer to be a particularly important place of grounding and nourishing. And it sounds, uh, I hope it doesn't sound pietistic or sort of saccharine. It's really, um, it's really the opposite. I think we cut the bishop off mid-sentence, <laughs> but I, I think we heard uh, where he was going with that. So Chris, back to you. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. This, uh, I've been telling Marvin and Tamara every time we've had our meeting that this will forever be the summer of queer spirit in my mind. And getting to hear those voices again after listening to this, spending all summer with them was a joy. Um, and so as a transition to our brief tour of the online exhibit, 
Um, just to think about those voices we just heard, I think as many of you know already, part of what historical exhibits do are to foster an interaction between people and sources. Um, but the other thing that exhibits do is to try to help people approach sources in a certain way um, or approach sources with an eye for something. And so, so much of this exhibit that you're gonna see and what I think we began to hear in those four snippets is the ways that the guests on this show and what this show represents is the ways that queerness and sacredness commingle with each other. Um, and as Reverend Tamara already brought up, I think one of the reasons why this summer was so life-giving for me was because so much of this resonated with my own background um, and gave me words to kind of wrestle with my own experience and then going forward. And so what has kind of stood out to me, and I think what is, is seen throughout this exhibit um, and as I was just trying to figure out why this resonated so much with me and kind of what was my takeaway from this exhibit this summer um, was not that so many of, if not all of these interviews, attest maybe not so much to the fact that sexuality is spiritual or spirituality is sexual, though it could be those things. What has really resonated with me this summer is that somehow in people's lives, the planes of experience that we call sexuality and spirituality actually overlap. And that we need to address that overlap if we're gonna know where we are and who we are. And so that was a gift to me. And so I hope that this exhibit will kind of give that life and that sense of, of positionality to you as well. So with that in mind, let's dive in. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with LGBTQ RAND's website. If you are not, let me just show you, if you go to the regular website, how to find this exhibit. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the tab on education. And the first thing you're gonna see is online exhibits. So after you click there, the first one that you're gonna see is this podcast, the Queer Spirit Podcast. And so for sake of time, just to hopefully leave some room for more discussion going on, I'll just say when you get to this landing page, it will say so much of what has already been said um, about not only where the podcast came from, what the founding assumptions and guidelines are for the podcast, but uh, we'll do that shaping work to give you the right posture as you go forward into the exhibit. So when you enter in, you have this little welcome page before you go on to the podcast background that Marvin walked us through earlier. You kind of see where the show came from, its trajectory, and then especially the what Marvin and Tamara were talking about earlier on about the fact that both queerness and spirituality are something that are here, are things that are here to stay. Those assumptions are to be found at the bottom of this page on the podcast background, and I'd encourage you to go read it. Um, from there, you dive a little bit into the history of the medium of the show itself. As you've been reminded tonight, and as you're reminded on this page, that Queer Spirit as a show was actually a radio show before it was a podcast. Um, it aired on public radio, WMPG 90.9 FM, which was a radio station sponsored by the University of Southern Maine. And so on this page on Queer Radio, it kind of dives in not only to this unique medium, um, at least it was unique for me, especially from a queer perspective in terms of, I, I don't know if I've ever stumbled on a queer radio show, but there is a deep history to radio as a queer medium for a host of reasons. And so this page will dive into a little bit of that, that about the history of queer radio, but then also the ways that this show represents in a lot of ways, the tension that it is addressing. Mainly what Marvin brought up earlier about the fact that they were in that Marvin and Tamara were involved in this community that had envisioned only a single radio program on religion and queerness. And then that turned around to become this ginormous show that ran for about three years and interviewed 30 plus people. Um, and so a deeper tradition than just that would been just a single show for sure. So from the history of queer radio and at the Outcast Radio Collective. You dive into this main tab over here, the queer spirits, which is kind of the the depths of the of this exhibit itself. This is where you're going to get in to the individual episodes themselves. Um, and so how this will how it will work is that if you would like to listen to the interviews on your computer, 
all you do is find someone you're interested in, you click on them, and that will take you to their individual page, which will they'll give, you'll see a survey of the episode itself. Then you can listen to the interview here and then read more about them. Or if you would like to download it for your commute, or if you are someone that takes walks or rides bikes, um, you can also click on this link here, listen to Spotify, and this will take you to the Spotify page, either on your phone or your computer, and that you can download the individual episodes themselves onto your phone or onto your device so you can access them anywhere with or without internet. So if you go back, you can go through all of the 30 plus interviews that we have. And again, I think Marvin and Tamara both, rep both mentioned it about the rich diversity that this show encompassed, even though this show was rooted in Maine. So in Maine, they were able to talk to someone who considers themselves an ex-Mormon. I think I counted that there were two or three interviews of ex-Catholic um, folks who now find themselves in a different spiritual tradition or a host of people who would just describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. So as you go through here, you can explore their lives and experiences. And then from there, the next part of the exhibit talks about this question that I think is important, um, not only to uh, historians in general like me, but then also individual communities like the community in Maine, this question of sustainability, about after you have a radio program, if that radio program isn't going to be stored with the original radio show itself, what do you do with this show? And so this page chronicles the bringing together of LGBTQ RAN and the queer spirit folks to showcase not only the fact that this question of sustainability of what do you do with something that you made um, after you make it and how do you make sure it's accessible to other people. But then it, I think, is a great page that just is a good reminder of of that there are institutions that exist like the LGBTQ Religious Archives Network that already have the infrastructure in place to help you um, make you, whatever you made accessible to more people, to help get the word out that this is something that, it, it, that is worth preserving, and these are the people that you should know. This page is also really important because this is the first one where you kind of get a sense of when the show Queer Spirit first came about, kind of the bigger hopes that were part of that show, and that those are these four points down here, and a lot of those hopes had to deal with education, education in higher ed, education in secondary schools, but also education within religious spaces, um, which hopefully later on, if we have time, I'd love to have um, Reverend Tamara and Marvin talk more about what, the, what those educational opportunities within religious congregations or communities might look like. Um, but those educational hopes, which kind of dive us in, uh, or will send us into something that's really central to this exhibit, and I'll come back to this uh, do-it-yourself page in just a second. But part of that educational hope or educational mission of Queer Spirit um, is about how do you, how then do you introduce these podcast episodes into the classroom? And so this is a page that will house hopefully a, a developing uh, or an ongoing series of teaching resources. And the first one you see you have here, if you click on this, you can download it. Um, and it, I think it is, I, it is designed to be broad enough to be used in different classrooms, depending on, regardless of where students are. And so this one is about um, what does embodiment mean? How do people both embody spirituality and sexuality? And how does that embodied experience show us the ways that spirituality and sexuality are linked? which is kind of a final word is to say that these are really important, deep and rich conversations that happened on Queer Spirit. And that even though this show, Queer Spirit was rooted in Maine, we know, and I think just looking at the chat, we are a testament to the fact that there are queer spirits everywhere, um, outside of Maine, across the con continent, around the world. And so if you are curious and or inspired about doing your own show or doing your own podcast like Queer Spirit, this is a great page for you to begin at. And um, this is where Marvin and Tamara talk a lot about their own experience about making this radio show and then this podcast, but kind of the, the main things to get and to keep in mind as you begin to tell the, your, the stories of your own queer spirits in your own neighborhood. 
So that is the online exhibit that we hope that you will spend more time in than I've had time to go over tonight, um, either on here or on Spotify. Like I said, personally, it has been a rich and full summer getting to listen to all of these folks, and I hope that you get that opportunity as well. And with that, I think we are turning it over and someone can correct me if I'm stop to share here. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have time for some Q&A. So if you have any burning questions for Marvin, for Tamara, um, about Queer Spirit as a show, about what does it look like to host a show like this, um, or how you might do it, or just their experience in general, now is the time. I think we can use the Q&A chat feature is what's preferred. And so take a time to think and write your question down and we can address it. And as we wait for that, I um, I guess I'd just like to say that, you know, Chris talked about our hopes for the exhibit and there, there are many hopes that this could be used in a whole variety of ways. But um, I guess the thing that I hope most is that people will carry these stories literally in their pockets. I, I don't know about you, but I often end up going for walks with a favorite podcast um, and it grounds me, it roots me, it, it it allows me to both be present in the place that I am, but also to think beyond the place that I am. And um, and in my experience, I, I have conversations with my religious community. Um, I also have conversations with queer friends, but I don't often, as Chris talked about, have those conversations at that intersection. And so uh, these conversations to me feel like the ability to go for a walk with all of these wise spirits who have journeyed in a whole host of ways, but ways that deepen me spiritually, but especially deepen me spiritually understanding um, what it is to be a queer person, because it is a deep part. I don't think I could extract my queerness from my sense as a spiritual being. And so to be able to walk with other folks who um, have integrated those pieces of self and, and bring wisdom from that journey has been a great comfort for me. And I know that there are many people in places that they don't feel like they have someone to talk to about these issues. And so to just have those conversations in your pocket as you go for a walk and know that you are not alone and also to, um, uh, sometimes we can know something in an embodied way and not yet have language for how to have that conversation with folks in our larger community. And so I not only felt like these were a great comfort, but they also equipped me with language to talk about who I am and how I am in new ways um, with people who love me. So I, that's, that is just my hope for all of you if you are interested in listening. I, that's so well said, Tamara. But let, let me just add my own word. Uh, um, we did have many hopes and you've articulated so well the hope that folks would find these uh, interviews, um, good conversation partners. Um, I, I will say that one of the things Tamara and I agreed uh, at the very beginning is that if we were going to invite others to come and talk about queer life and the power of the sacred, uh, that she and I should do that ourselves. And so tomorrow interviewed me and I interviewed her. So our own um, guest spots are included uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the podcast. I, I think we definitely thought about an audience of queer folks and our allies who hunger for this kind of rich conversation about things spiritual and uh, things that matter to LBGTQ folks and, and the people who love us. I think we also thought this could be a series uh, that educators, uh, religious studies uh, professors and scholars and um, high school uh, social studies teachers uh, could pick uh, a few of these podcasts and uh, uh, do a lesson plan and also encourage their students um, to conduct their own interviews. Um, we originally started this series in a, in a radio station with all that sophisticated uh, recording equipment, but um, COVID upended that. So we relied on Zoom to, to record these conversations. So a, a simple technology like Zoom is a ready at hand opportunity for you to try out 
uh, do it yourself um, and, and get started. But we also thought about uh, an audience like uh, the welcoming uh, congregations and open and affirming um, movement in so many places these days, a, a, re a, a resource for congregations that are exploring the possibility of uh, being more welcoming and inclusive, but also for those congregations that have already made that turn, but want to deepen their conversation and connection with the wide, wide diversity of LBGTQ folks. And I think a, a last sort of audience that I've thought about are folks that are doing sexuality education, gender studies, uh, our whole lives uh, curriculum, um, social workers who might well find these podcasts an enrichment of, of uh, the work they're already, already doing. That's great. We do have two questions and I'll start with the first one just because it seems to dovetail well with what you both are, what you've touched on a little bit, but first, um, this comes from Frank Brooks about how did being co-hosts and co-interviewers enrich your own spiritual lives? And then would you recommend co-hosting versus hosting alone? I mean, I, you know, the, the story of this um, radio show is in some ways I kind of got to ride in on Marvin's coattails. He had the relationship with Outcast. Uh, and there was this this moment where they asked him to do this one show, and he said, I, "I think we can do better than that." Um, you know, the the truth of the matter is Marvin is a brilliant and joyful person to be around. So Marvin could have asked me if I wanted to go dig clams, and I would have said yes. But in this case, he asked me to do a radio show. That seemed like fun, too. So there I was. Um, but I will say there was something about the experience of um not just being co-hosts, but being co-hosts across a variety of, um, life experiences and across that generational uh, journey, because I do think that, um, uh, you know, uh, in queer life, we stand, we stand upon each other's shoulders, right? And so my generation actually had a really different conversation because of the work that Marvin's generation had done. And my hope is that the generations coming after me will say, ah, we, we were able to have a different conversation because of the conversations you had. And so that um, both that hope that is passed down, that courage that is passed down, right? That um, fortitude. Uh, you know, sometimes we are not able to have um, that generational support from people in our biological families. And so we create those chosen families um, and those chosen communities that remind us that we are not alone and that um, that there is a way forward, even when it looks like there isn't one. They they give us reminders of like, oh yeah, we've seen impossible before, and then it changed, right? And we were part of that change. So for me, um, even just the simple ask of of having a radio conversation with people, it made me feel braver to do it, knowing that I had this resource of not just my lived experience, but this these multiple stories that were going into it. Um, uh, but also, you know, in fairness, it also widened the pool from folks we knew, right? Like queer, queer community does act as a family. And, um, and as Marvin's and my families began to co-mingle, it was a much wider pool of stories and people and experiences. And we were drawn to, to different people. What started at first with, okay, well, let's talk to, you know, colleagues that we know, then brought it, who are religious professionals, then it moved into, ah, but then there's this poet who is a deep mystic. And, oh, what about this embodied somatic practitioner? And we were able to keep um, the conversation going with each other in a way that I think rippled us outward into wider communities of conversation. Uh, also, lastly, it's just like so much more fun not to do this alone. I'm probably, um, you know, showing off what an extrovert I am, but the idea of being able to be in this project together uh, with someone I, I dearly love, uh, especially in the midst of um, the depth of that pandemic lockdown, to have these conversations feeding my soul at a time when I really, really needed those those deep companionship conversations that we got to have with people. It was a real pleasure. But it does, um, as as you mentioned, there, there are queer people of spirit around the globe. And I certainly hope that some will take up this mantle and have more of these conversations because I, I think we would all be nourished um, by by even more of these conversations and exploding them out of one localized place and into a broader context. Well, you've almost left me speechless. 
tomorrow. That was such a lovely response. I, and and I'll just say, indeed, this was a pleasure. This was a joy. And, and to be honest, um, Tamara and I have known each other for a while. We've done work together. We've both been volunteer chaplains at Planned Parenthood, and uh, we've made other kinds of good trouble together. And in the midst of all that, we've had this kind of running conversation about both the joy and the challenge of being uh, queer religious folks. Um, because many times um, we found it challenging uh, to, to come out as spiritual or religious in queer spaces, but there's also been a challenge of being fully ourselves as queer people in religious spaces. And so part of what I had found so empowering and healing for me was to have a friend and colleague like Tamara to have this ongoing conversation about, so how does this look to you? And how do you handle that? And where does your heart sing? And how are we going to deal with this? And and so we thought, well, we're, we're enjoying this so much. Why don't we bring in some of our friends and enlarge the conversation? So yes, it looked like a serious, you know, um, quite uh, thoughtful um, design of a radio series. But truth of the matter was, it was doing what I love and what she loves and looking for other people to join us. So my hope is that this online exhibit with LBGTQ Religious Archives Network will not only be an archive of what's been done, but it will be an, an example, an encouragement to others to replicate in their own way, in their own locations, a, a, a similar kind of, of, of project. Um, and, and the truth of the matter is, you know, one of the gifts of coming out is coming into that beautifully diverse, sometimes cantankerous, but always fascinating community of, of queer folks. Um, and who wants to miss out on that? <laughs> no one. No one. Um, I think we have time for one more quick question. This comes from Jane Field, and this feels like a good one to end on, because we can end on memory a little bit, um, about could both of you, could either or both of you just tell us a quick story of a time that you were surprised by something an interviewee shared, or it, if, if nothing comes to mind, maybe even a moment that sticks with you from this process. T Tamara, what about because I've heard you mention Nicole's uh, feedback to us about the, one of the questions we had posed. Yeah. So, so actually, it was both Nicole and Rabbi Rachel. I'm getting funny feedback all of a sudden. Think you're okay? Am I okay? Okay. Um, we had originally a question about, um, uh, you know, remembering the "It Gets Better" campaign and and using that campaign as a way of talking about, you know, n what queer wisdom would you pass on to others? Um, and and both of those wise souls said, you know, that that campaign had its time and its place, but you know, it 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 sort of made some assumptions. Um, it it really worked as a campaign for certain people in social in certain social locations, but it sort of assumed that you know maybe if you're growing up in a community where you are not fully received as an LGBTQ person or not received by your family, you can pick up and leave that all behind and forge a different life somewhere. Um, and and for many of us, a we may not want that. We may want to find a way to struggle forward with our families intact, with communities that maybe are not at the in uh, not having exactly the same conversation about LGBTQ identities. Um, but it might be a different part of our identity that we are unwilling to set down or leave behind. Um, but also, it presumes this ability to pick up and move your life. Uh, and and that that's not actually true for a lot of people. Um, you know, per perhaps you are someone who is queer and that is not affirmed by your parent and you are your parent's caretaker and you're going to live in your house with them. 
Uh, perhaps you're in a community that being out isn't safe, and yet it doesn't make you any less queer. And so uh, they pushed back against that that sort of framework of it gets better. And, and after hearing their feedback, we changed the way we asked that question um, because it did sort of uh, impose one model for what um, like queer liberation can look like. Uh, and it's a narrow model. And so um, I think in in uh, that conversation with those two interviewees, um, we were pushed to reimagine what queer hope and queer wisdom can look like um, and broaden our notions of um, of what that that liberation can feel like and look like for other members in our community. Um, so yeah, and uh, I think there were quite a few moments. Another one that I am just remembering is we had a, a conversation with um, one of our interviewees who talked about having grown up and having um, experienced sexual trauma uh, in a church context, but at the hands of a um, person who had been a trusted uh, same-sex mentor. And so feeling like, oh man, if I talk about that abuse, um, I am only going to deepen stigma around LGBTQ people in church spaces. How do I tell the truth of harm that happened to me and not feel like I am causing harm in the wider discourse, right? How can both these things be true? That was a challenging conversation and one that sort of asked me to, to think in my own life, where are the places that I uh, don't tell the whole of my story? Because there is a political implication to our stories. And where do I feel like I am not myself, but I am a political representation of something. Where am I allowed to tell the whole truth and where do I make my truth more narrow to, to force it into a political agenda? And so um, both of those things for me were really deep conversations that pushed me to grow in new ways. Did you have any others, Marvin? I think you're muted, Marvin. It wouldn't be a good Zoom conference if we didn't have at least one of those moments. Exactly, exactly. And how many times did we have to say to each other or to our guests when we did the um, interviews, uh, you've muted yourself. And um, some of those uh, we've excised out um, of the podcast, but there may be one or two still, still there. Um, one of the things that I think the whole series reinforced to me is that um, um, spiritual vitality, spiritual integrity, spiritual imagination is often found uh, among uh, communities of marginalized folks. And I, I think Bell Hooks was so helpful for me to think about marginality in a, in a different way than I had, because she said, often we speak of marginality as a site of, of deprivation. Mm -hmm. um, of loss. Um, but she said marginality can also be thought of as a space of freedom, of creativity, of reimagining the self, the community, the world. And I think one of the gifts uh, of this series, and I think of queer lives more generally, the, the real blessing um, is the courage uh, and generosity of queer folks uh, to become visible and vocal um, and speak our truth, uh, trusting that there are those who want to hear and will respond in kind. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the gifts for me of this series is how generous our guests have been with us tomorrow um, to, in 26 minutes, go deep, and share some remarkable queer wisdom. I'm not gonna try to cite any of particulars about that queer wisdom, but just leave that as an enticement for others um, to go explore uh, and enjoy, and I hope um, be both challenged and supported uh, to go and do likewise. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Chris, Marvin, and and Tamara for this informative and inspiring program. Amazing discussion. And thanks to all of you who participated, offered comments and questions. Uh, within a few days, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording tonight's program. There were a few people who wanted to be here tonight, 
but instead are watching this little gathering happening here in Chicago. There is a recording that everybody can see and you can share with friends and colleagues. If you're interested in more opportunities to explore the history of queer religious movements, check out the LGBTQ REN website and particularly our events page. There you will find announcements of future online programs as well as recordings of past presentations. Our next program will be on Thursday, September 26th, in which LGBTQ REN advisor Derek McQueen will interview Brandon Thomas Crowley on his new book, Queering Black Churches, Dismantling Heteronormativity in African American Churches. You can sign up now to join us for this groundbreaking conversation on September 26th. In closing, I remind you that LGBTQ REN is the first and foremost source of information on LGBTQ plus religious history. We are a very small operation that is funded through the generosity of friends like you. So if you would like to see more programs like this one, and if you share our commitment to ensure that future generations will hear our voices and stories, please help make this happen with your gift. You can either scan the QR code you see on the screen or click on the donate button on the LGBTQ RAN homepage. With your credit card in hand, it only takes a couple of minutes to make a gift. Your gift does make a difference. On behalf of everyone here, I offer so much gratitude to Riot for to the technical management of tonight's program and to Chris, Tamara, and Marvin for their fascinating presentation. Good night to all. Oh.